Hi, everybody. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know Selects. It's a Saturday, but I'm here anyway because I love you. This week, I am choosing The Wind Cries Typhoid Mary from October 13th, 2011. And uh, to be honest, I picked this one, well, for a couple of reasons. A is because I love it. I love our history podcasts. And this one was super, super interesting. And uh, the other reason is, uh, to be honest, I really just love this title, The Wind Cries Typhoid Mary. I titled this one myself, and I just wanted to see it in our feed again because I like looking at it. So here we go. The Wind Cries Typhoid Mary. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Grinny Boy, Chuck Bryant. And Jerry. Yeah. Back in the, his house. Yep. No more guest producing. No. That was a rough week. Sure was. But she's back. Yeah. Hey, Jerry. Did you hear that, everybody? Probably not. <laughs> Chuck. Yes. Jerry. Have you guys ever heard how much manure a horse produces in a day? I'm glad you went with this. I was never really occurred to me. Go ahead. Uh, 25 pounds. 25 pounds of manure. Did you do the math? Because I did. I, I Well, you come with that in a second, okay? okay. So um, l- l- just go back with me a little bit, Chuck, to the time when Daniel Day-Lewis was walking around New York with a meat cleaver, overacting a little bit, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and uh, it's the, the, the late 19th century. And the horse is the um, is the preferred mode of transportation for everything. Sure. From the the most humble delivery cart to the greatest ambulance to you know people who like to ride horses, three musketeers, that kind of thing. Everybody had a horse. To the limo, to the airport, wherever. So there were about two hundred thousand horses in New York City in use in eighteen ninety five, right? Yeah. Multiply that times 25 pounds of poop a day. And what do you get, Chuck? Well, I did 225,000 because I thought that was the number. Okay, so that's fine. We'll go with that. More than 6.2 million pounds of horse poop per day deposited on the streets of New York. Okay. Now, um, let's say that's 1894. Okay. Okay. Um, there's that many horses. There's 6.2 million pounds of horse poop every day. That's a lot. It's a lot of poop, but not only that, there was no one cleaning it up. It not, was not just, enough people cleaning it up, let's say that for sure. It was just left there, basically, in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. um, to basically be ground into the cobblestone. And, yeah. You know, it, it makes you think, like, I'll bet there's a substantial layer of horse manure under the streets of New York <laughs> that make up, like, that initial stratum of yeah. of of earth. They call it's that poop. the uh, the pooposphere. <laughs> right. I think. Oh wait, that would be in outer space. No, yeah. no, because the lithosphere is. Uh, oh, is it? Part okay. Of, yes. So you were dead on. Thank you. The pooposphere. Um, 1895. Things changed a little bit. The uh, New York Institute's a uh, Department of Health, and a group of uh, basically an army of cleaning guys, very much like the the um, the garbage man that Homer Simpson envisions. In the in the uh, uh, the garbage commissioner episode, I can't remember which one it is. Yeah, uh, oh, the Love Day episode is what it is. Okay, um, the, these guys—they're called White Wings. They are deployed to clean up the streets of New York, and they do a heck of a job. Yeah, and possibly the fact of the the episode, if I may take it, please. This is where the term cleanliness is next to godliness is coined. Pretty cool. The New York Department of Health slogan. In yeah. 1895. Downtown New York, Josh, at the turn of the century back then, was a disgusting, filthy place. And yet, I love New York. I love the history of New York. We watched, a, we both watched the same Nova video on Typhoid Mary today, and yep. they had photos of mountains of manure mm-hmm. pushed to the sidewalks. And uh, sort of like if you've ever been in New York on Garbage Day, <laughs> imagine all those garbage bags as poop. Yeah, but not poop in bags, just mounds just poop. of poop. And there were dead 
uh, car- animal carcasses. Did dead you see that people, one shot? Probably. It was like these boys playing in the street with the, just a dead horse right in the middle of their <laughs> little right. stick ball diamond. Yeah. I guess he was on base or something. Yeah. And it was just a foul, disgusting, unclean, unsanitary place, which, like you said, led to the formation of the Department of Sanitation. Right. So the Thank Department, God. the Department of Sanitation, um, was imbued with a lot of clout. Uh, from it's the get go, yeah, and as you said, the 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 Nova documentary on on Typhoid Mary, mm-hmm. it's called like the most dangerous woman in America, I yeah, believe. I think so. But it's also on YouTube under Typhoid Mary Nova. Yeah, that's good. Uh, it was, um, but they had a lot of clout. They could forcibly inoculate you uh-huh. with these newfangled inoculations. They could forcibly remove you to a quarantine island, and New York had a bunch of them. Yeah, that was popular at the time. Yeah, but basically your civil liberties could be entirely suspended without any sort of due process of law mm-hmm. um, and you, if the, you were considered sick. And a lot of this was based on this new understanding of science, uh, of germ theory, thanks to our buddy Louis Pasteur. Bacteriology. Yep. Um, so the problem was science reporting hadn't been established yet. So all of the people who were in charge understood what was going on. They understood yeah. germ theory. They understood inoculations. They understood forced quarantine. Mm-hmm. But no one had explained it to the public fully. Right. So when, It's a recipe for disaster. Right. So there's this thing called typhus or typhoid. I'm sorry. And apparently they were one and the same until the 19th century. About this time, typhus and typhoid, typhoid fever, were separated. But typhoid fever, fever which is the star of this, mm-hmm co-star of this episode sure um it's particularly nasty isn't it it is josh uh we're talking not just ordinary diarrhea but doubled over cramping painful diarrhea i think you'd call that violent diarrhea violent diarrhea uh high fever red rashes sleeplessness death if you don't treat it Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people through history have been uh, stricken with it including mary todd lincoln georgia o'keefe Ravi Shankar, <laughs> uh, Roy Cohn, Frank. Oh, really? No, no. Uh, Frank McCourt, author, and uh, Wilbur Wright, actually of the Wright brothers' fame, died from typhoid fever. No way! Yeah, wow, pretty sad. And that was, I mean, that's a scant uh, sampling from a long, long list of famous people that have. Well, those are had the typhoid. people who count who had typhoid. Yeah, fever. I think Lincoln's son actually died as, from it as well, but I don't think Mary Todd Lincoln died from it. Yeah, but you can. No, she died of. Um Insanity or something like that is what they would have called <laughs> oh, it. No, that was then. Abraham. Or Lincoln. hysterics. Right. Okay. Nice. Um, so before we started to get a handle on typhoid fever, it's by the way, it's a um, it's caused by the bacterium Salmonella typhi. Mm-hmm. It's a type of Salmonella. Um, and before we got a handle on it with antibiotics, apparently twelve percent of people died from typhoid. So it was a big public health problem. Yeah, New York especially, there were 4,000 new cases per year and uh, killed one in 10 people at the time. Or one in 12%. Okay. (laughs) However that goes. Was that nationwide? Uh, Yeah, as I understand it, before antibiotics. Gotcha. So um, let's even just say 10%. That's a big public health problem. And because it's spread by the bacterium Salmonella, did that come out weird? Because it did in my head. Slightly. A little bit of the, the lazy tongue there. <laughs> because because of uh, because it's spread through salmonella, or because it's a result of salmonella, it's very, very easily spread from handling your uh, own poop, e.g. using the bathroom, not washing your hands, yeah. and then handling food, uncooked food specifically. Yeah. It was normally considered to be like a, a disease of the lower classes. Yeah. Until 1906, was it, Chuck? The summer of 1906, in a, in a wealthy quarter of the United States on Long Island called Oyster Bay. Billy Joel's home, I believe. <laughs> it's neither here nor there. Okay. Still, uh, it's just, that's one extra fact you just gave everybody. <laughs> that's true. Uh, yeah, when it, when it happened in uh, Oyster Bay, it was a much bigger deal because... It was more closely associated with, let's say, the Lower East Side, mm-hmm. tenement housing, the yeah. filth of Lower Manhattan at the time. They've cleaned all that up now. Um, I mean, it is expensive. <laughs> what you get, though, when you're in Oyster Bay is you get wealthy families who can uh, spend a little money, and that's what you had in the case of the Thompson family. 
they were afraid that they would not be able to rent out the house that they were living in because uh, people were getting sick in that house over and over and over, and they couldn't figure it out. They decided to hire an investigator uh, who turned out to be a very prominent figure in this case named Dr. George Soper, Mm -hmm. a sanitation engineer and uh, epidemiologist. One of the first epidemiologists. Really looking to make his career. Well, he As already had out. he had a reputation um, of of you know being able to track any illness back to its source. So this family, the Thompson family, is that the one who owned the house or the one who got sick? They owned the house, and I believe some family members had also gotten sick. Okay, so but there was a family that rented it originally, and that's where the typhoid outbreak first happened. Oh, so maybe maybe they were just the homeowners. The Thompson it. family hired Soper, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And said, hey, we can't rent this house anymore because people are dying from typhoid. <laughs> well, that was their concern. Right, yeah. So Soper gets on the case, starts, um, finds the family where the uh, typhoid outbreak occurred, and starts interviewing the heck out of them. And he's stumped. He can't figure it out. Like, where did this thing come from? Yeah. These are clearly patient zeros. Right here, like nobody else on Oyster Bay had it before then. Right, right. Uh, they, they didn't bring it with them from the city. There's somebody missing. There's something missing. And he finally says, have I talked to everybody who was in this house in the summer of 1906? And they said, you should talk to Typhoid Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think of that. And he goes, what? No, what he did was he interviewed kitchen staff, and it turns out that there was a former employee that was no longer there. Mary Mallon. Yeah. And he said, wait a minute, you know, maybe I should check this lady out. Yeah. Turns out she loved to serve this ice cream and fresh peaches, mm -hmm. which is uncooked. Right. And that was her, I guess her, she was noted for that dessert. Right. But even more incriminating than the dessert is the idea that when he looked into her history, she'd worked for eight families in 10 years and six of those families had had ty typhoid outbreaks. Yeah. So he began to think that there was uh, something special about Mary Mallon and, and that she was what's called a healthy carrier, meaning um, – and, and I'm just going to paraphrase this awesome way that Nova Doc put it, mm -hmm. right? When you get typhoid fever, there's almost always a clear winner. If the bacteria wins, you die. And yeah. the, if you if you win, if your immune system wins, the bacteria dies. But there's sometimes where there's a stalemate where your immune system continues to function and you live, and the bacteria continues to live in your system, which means you're healthy, but you're also extremely contagious. Yeah. And that's what Soper came to believe Mary Mallon was. So she was technically, she actually had typhoid fever, but her immune system was able to suppress all of it. Right. Except the killing of the all the bacteria part. Right. So pretty cool. Super not cool, but interesting because this is brand new. Yeah. And this guy's time. on the cutting edge of this kind of thinking. Yeah, and he knew like potentially she could be the face of bacteriology. The first bacteriology lab had just set up in New York City mm -hmm. and it was a, a burgeoning uh not industry but science. So he was like, man, this is really going to put me on the map if I can pr right. the, prove this at least. So he, he didn't have any training in science reporting either, though, did he? He didn't have training in people skills, no. evidently, either. He goes to her and he's like, I finally found you. I believe you're infected with typhoid, so I need uh, samples of your stool, your urine, and your blood. By the way, my name is George Soper. Good to meet yeah. you. And she's like, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, so it's about this time that, that uh, Mary Mallon... Well, who is she? We should describe who she is, at least. Oh, go ahead, Chuck. Mary Mallon was Irish. Right. She, uh, Irish, came over as a teenager by herself. Mm -hmm. She was born in the poorest town, county, in Ireland. And Ireland at that time, especially in the poorest county, not a great place to be. No. Also dirty, also lots of death and dying and filth and disease. And she was born in 1869, so I think that's on the heels of the potato famine, if not still yeah. in the middle of it. So she comes over as a teenager, lives with her aunt and her uncle who pass away, and then is basically on her own in New York. And by all accounts, as a result of how she grew up and then being on her own in New York, 
she was very, very tough and fiery. And independent and resourceful. Like, had it been anyone else, this might not have gone down like this. No, huh? They picked, literally, not picked, but as it turns out, it sounds like she was the toughest, most obstinate, stubborn, fiery woman in New York City. Right. And, but she was also good at what she did. She worked her way up in the um, domestic servant classes. Uh Uh-huh. To the the pinnacle of it, a cook in that era in the domestic yeah. in, in domestic service and sort of manager of the kitchen staff. Well, not just that, almost the whole house yeah. basically. The the all of the servants, the cook was pretty much at the top, maybe tied with the butler depending on the house. But um, she was a cook for all these these families, and not just you know families that could afford a cook, but like very wealthy families. Yeah. Um, so she was doing really she was, well for she herself. She was good at her, her at her job, but she took no guff. From any man. And uh, when Soper came and told her that he wanted her feces, she chased him <laughs> off with a carving fork, supposedly. That's how Soper reported it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'll get into her specifics later. And, and she got a real bad rap. But at the time, there was, like you said, there was no understanding on the public's behalf of this. This whole zero, uh, I'm sorry, healthy carrier is not even proven yet. So, I mean, what is she supposed to do? Just say, like, sure, I'll go with you, stranger. Right. Take my poop. Right. And and put me in a quarantine. Yeah. So she fought it like she probably had every right to. Right. Most people, though, wouldn't normally, you know, brandish a a fork, a carving fork on somebody. But, again, it's lost to history whether she really did do that or not. It's a good story. So Soper takes off, and he's not one to let his career just kind of slip through his fingers. And he goes to the uh, New York Commissioner of Health. Herman Biggs. So Biggs was, he was the one, he was the first one, and he was the one who was like, oh, by the way, we can come into your house and forcibly inoculate you and your children if we want, and we will do that, too, yeah. if we if we think that it's in the interest of the public health. So Biggs was very um, sympathetic to Soper's description of the story of this crazy Irish woman who was uh, just patient zero in more than one outbreak. Um, and basically needed to be dealt with. Yeah. So he ordered a, uh, one of his, uh, caseworkers, a few, a few cops and an ambulance out to where Mary lived, a tenement. Yeah. Josephine Baker was the, uh, inspector and not the dancer. No, but she apparently was pretty tough lady as well. Oh yeah. She started Um, her own rainbow family. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, and you know, we should also point out one of the reasons that Malin was so upset initially was that she got the feeling they were essentially calling her dirty and unsanitary. Right, yeah. Because he explained to her, like, oh, you go poop, and then you get poop in your hands, and you handle peaches that you feed people. And so she was very, uh, she was upset that they felt like she, they were picking on her cleanliness. Right. Which, she's like, of course, she's, she's going to be She's just offended. a dirty Irish immigrant or something Yeah, exactly. Like they were, you know, dirty drunks and causing problems, and that was just the stereotype at the time. And mm-hmm. she wasn't like that, she said. Right. So, um, Soper goes to, uh, Biggs. Biggs orders some people out. They use their power and grab Mary. Well, she hides out in the house for a while, though. Okay. Like, it took three hours to find her. Well, when they finally did, yeah. apparently it took all, either three or four cops to drag her to the ambulance. And then the, the female caseworker sat on her <laughs> for the whole ride to this hospital, this quarantine hospital. Yeah. Where she was kept for a while. And like you said, it, it's, it just happened to work out that the person who was, who was typhoid Mary was this very stubborn, obstinate, self-assertive woman mm-hmm. from Ireland. And she, she came about at a time where there was a big question about public health. Like, you know, where do an individual's civil rights and, yeah. and public, the greater public good begin? That's still going on. It still is, but she forced this this conversation into the national spotlight starting Absolutely. about now. Yeah. So they keep her, they test her. They they're like you need to poop into this bag right now. Yeah. And she did. Um and they tested it and they said, "Well, this thing's lousy with typhoid." They they right. called her stool a factory for typhoid. <laughs> yeah. And uh what they did was they said, "Here's a deal. Give up cooking cuz that's how you're transmitting this." And we'll let you go. And she. So, so did they say that immediately? I caught that I from the so. article, but not necessarily from the documentary. I think they initially offered her that deal that she refused, which 
was one reason why she was, you know, lambasted in the in the public later on in newspapers. But again, at the time, she had managed to climb up out of the, uh, you know, poor conditions that she was living in in Ireland and mm-hmm. get a really good job mm-hmm. and one that she was good at. And uh, she didn't want to have to learn something new and start over again. So at the time, you know, like later on, I can dole out some of the blame on her. But early on, she still feels well. Right. It's like, I'm not sick. This doesn't make any sense. What is this healthy carrier thing? Yes. Yeah, she was not buying it at all. No. And she basically came to believe that the public health department had a vendetta against her personally and felt quite persecuted. Um so when she said no, she wasn't going to stop cooking, they said, okay, well, we're going to take you to a nice little island called North Brother Island. It was not a nice island. 1907, they took her there and quarantined her there. North Brother Island is a, um, or it was a tuberculosis hospital quarantine, quarantine yeah. hospital, I should say. And she didn't have tuberculosis and she wasn't even sick. She didn't have any symptoms. And yet she was being kept here against her will on North Brother Island, which you sent a killer. Yeah urban exploration photo spread that I want everybody to go check out. It's creepy. It's on Gothamist.com, and uh, that's G-O-T-H-A-M-I-S-T, and it's titled A Trip to the Abandoned North Brother Island. It is so cool. Yeah, located there was uh, Riverside Hospital, and initially there was nothing there, and they said, hey, the the idea of island quarantines was pretty popular at the time, so we should build a hospital there Mm -hmm. so we can treat these people, but... um. North Brother Island sort of gained a reputation over the years because, one, it was, I mean, it was much more than tuberculosis. It was like, later on, it was like heroin junkies were treated there, syphilis, like any kind of nasty disease or addiction, they would dump you on at Riverside Hospital. It was an asylum. It basically was. It was sort of like, uh, what's the DiCaprio? Shutter Island? Shutter Island. Yeah. Um, But they had a hard time staffing it with real doctors for a while because doctors understandably didn't want to work there. So they had nurses only for a time. Eventually, there was a public campaign to clean it up and to build better buildings and change its rep, which sort of worked, sort of didn't. But um, in New York City at the time, especially in the Lower East Side and and where poor people lived, it had a a very bad reputation as you don't want to go there because you go there and you don't come back. Right. People were afraid of it. Right. So that's where they send this Mary uh, Malinoff to. So and when she gets there... um she starts trying to get out. She hired a um, not escaping, of right? <laughs> no, using legal channels. Yeah, she um, she st- she hired a uh, a lab, a private lab, and started sending them samples of her stool. And they were testing it, and they were not getting the same results. Me, her boyfriend would sneak her poop. Yeah, to the lab, and they weren't getting the same results that the public health department said that they were getting. Um, as far as her being a, a factory for typhoid. Right. Which could have been a false negative, right? It could have been. Because they said that you don't always uh, find it in the testing. Isn't that what they said in the documentary? I believe so. But there was a discrepancy, and it was enough for her to get her day in court. Yeah, New York Supreme Court. So she makes her way. She's allowed to um, to leave the island to go for her court date. And basically, the public health department was like, "Look, she's a she's a healthy carrier, and she's a public health threat." Yeah. And Mary's like, "These people are holding me against my will." And the New York Supreme Court said, "You're a public health threat. Go back to North Brother Island." Yeah. And around the same time, it started getting newspaper coverage, courtesy of William Randolph Hearst, who he might, may have financed yeah. her um, law. That's crazy. Her legal expenses. I imagine it was it was great for the papers, so yeah. I could see him throwing a little money toward it. Totally. But that's where she was dubbed Typhoid Mary, and that's where the public sentiment really swung, because she was painted as someone who was willingly giving people typhoid fever. Right. Well, no, she was, she was Not called purposely. Typhoid Mary because they were protecting her, um, her identity as well. <laughs> that didn't work too well. No. So... Mary um, goes back to North Brother Island and is there um, for another – well, she was there for three years total, I believe. And uh, on, in the third year, New York City got a new health commissioner. And he was not about basically squashing people's civil rights. Literally. So he not, he not only freed her, he got her a job. Yeah, and a lot of people, while she was incarcerated – And it was an incarceration, I guess. Um, There were a lot of people that did cry out for her release at times, um, public officials even. Mm -hmm. But the Department of Health 
basically it was such a unique case they wanted to experiment on her and said, "No, we're going to test, do some tests on her and not let her out." Well, they well, they did do some tests on her. They they thought that perhaps the gall bl- her gallbladder was the culprit. Yeah. So they were like, "We're going to take your gallbladder out," and she's like, "No, you're not." Yeah, she's like, "Nobody's touching me." She was afraid they were going to kill her. Well, it could have to. They did forcibly um, medicate her. They tried some stuff out, and she said that she wrote in a diary that she, if they keep this up for much longer, she'll surely die because it's just such a it's the side effects were so horrid. So it wasn't just like, "Hey, stay in this cottage." There's a nice view of the water. It was yeah. it was rough for her. In addition to the civil liberties being squashed, exactly. And so, as you pointed out, uh, the new commish comes in, letterly of public health, and a bit more sympathetic. Like you said, he found her a job in laundry, which apparently was the bottom of the barrel for for a woman uh, a woman's career aspirations. In in domestic servant, like no money, quarters. like the lowest pay, the worst work, and she was like, ah, "This sucks. <laughs> I don't want to do this. Right? I don't want to work in the laundry." Did you know that Atlanta has one of the um, taxi drivers in Atlanta um, is a Ghanese king? No way. That's what I thought of when I um. When I when I was reading about that, when when she got a job in the laundry, and it's like she worked her way past that. She's way past that. Is he really? There's a Ghanese king it's who, like, uh, who, coming to America who operates a cab here in Atlanta. They ain't none but ultra perm. <laughs> yeah, that was a good movie, <laughs> dude. I, I could quote it from heart. I think in full. Let's start. Okay. <laughs> Bark like a dog. <laughs> All right, so uh, back to Mary. Uh, where are we here? She's just been released, or he offered her the job, right? Yeah, and she's out, and she's making After three contact. years. Yeah, but she's making contact with the health department. They're like, we need to be able to keep up with you and make sure we know what you're doing and everything. And then they're they're like, we know where she is. We know what she's doing. We talk to her every day, and okay, we lost her. Yeah, we don't know where she is anymore. Yeah, it's pretty cool at the time. You could disappear. Yeah. And if you don't leave a forwarding address, it's like, oh, well, yeah. no Google searching going on there. You could disappear into the folds of Daniel Day-Lewis's overacting. <laughs> so a few years after this, Josh, after they had lost her, uh, Dr. Soper's brought in again to investigate another typhoid outbreak at uh, the upscale hospital, Sloan Hospital. And I think it was a, a baby birth and hospital at the time. Yeah. Maternity hospital? Yep. And uh, what they discovered was Mary was cooking in the kitchen under, at the hospital. Yeah, under an assumed name. 25 doctors and nurses were sick, and I believe two of them died. And they said, you know, um, you're in big trouble this time. Yeah, but not only did they discover it, was Soper himself was called into the case. This is like Les Miserables. And he, exactly, it is very much like that. Um, and he comes to the hospital and he, he recognizes Mary by sight as one of the cooking staff and is like, you were kidding me. She's whipping up her ice cream and peaches. She, she's, and just stops like yeah. mid stroke, like, um, she's got poop is, on her hands. This is awkward. So, um, this time she goes willingly. She knows that, that it's, it's over. It's done. She still doesn't believe that she is the, um, this, a, a carrier or the problem. Mm-hmm. But she knows that they think she is and that she's broken some sort of horrendous law somehow. It was kind of sad at that point from the way uh, it was described in the documentary. She was just sort of like, I mean, all the fight of, of this fiery woman was gone. And yeah. she was just like, I'm, I just can't fight this anymore. Take me. And part of it also, I imagine, was public opinion turned against her. Like you said, the first time she was incarcerated at um, North Brother Island, there was a lot of public outcry. This time, there was a lot of public outcry, but it was against her. Because she had willfully and knowingly gone back into cooking mm-hmm. um, and had gotten more people sick. Yeah. Like, I, I think 50-something cases were attributed to her and three deaths. Yeah, f- I think 49 to 52 is what I read. Um, and, and, you know, we got to say, like, I'm defending her in a lot of ways. But she they gave her a few pretty good deals along the way that she did not take, which was, A, to give up cooking, 
B, um, I think at one point they said, why don't you just move to Connecticut uh, with your sister? <laughs> and she's like, I don't have a sister. And they're like, sure you do, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, wait, are you having a stroke? <laughs> exactly. So she didn't take him up on that offer. And um, Soper promised her 100% of the profits of a book that he would write about her and about the situation. And she was like, no. Yeah. No, no, no. And wasn't that weird? Anthony Bourdain is one of the experts in that Nova documentary. Yeah. I thought, a little odd. Yeah. I guess he knows his typhoid Mary. Yeah. He He, he lives on Oyster Bay, I guess. With Billy Joel. So the the legacy um, of Typhoid Mary is this great debate over how much civil liberty, how many how many civil rights does a person get to keep when they pose some sort of public health threat? And I guess the answer to that is contagion. Yes. Have you seen it? I have not. You did the other night, right? Yeah, it's was good. it good? I like it. Is it frightening? No, it was definitely like I, I don't. My back was tense the whole time. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't frightening, but it was good. Uh, there was a really good editorial piece, too, that I read. I sent you um, where basically this could have gone down in so many different ways. It was sort of like the perfect storm of headstrong woman, uh, health guy that didn't have a lot of people skills. They said if that or his opinion was if that initial meeting had have gone down differently, the whole history might be rewritten. But it went down as them butting heads and just got worse from there. Mm hmm pretty interesting yeah so typhoid mary was she a a bad person josh oh i i can't i i reserve judgment on historical figures okay <laughs> i don't i don't know enough about them yeah i think you can only judge your contemporaries really all right what about me <laughs> i reserve judgment on on podcasters yeah <laughs> okay so, um, if you want to know more about Typhoid Mary, you can watch Nova's excellent documentary, The Most Dangerous Woman in America. Um, if you want to know the origin of the word quarantine, you should go back and listen to our Black Death episode. But, if you haven't heard it before, and you've read 1491, don't bother emailing in, I know already, I know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> You can also look up the How Stuff Works article, Who Was Typhoid Mary, T-Y-P-H-O-I-D space M-A-R-Y, question mark. You want to type that into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com, and that means it's time for listener mail. They should do a good movie about that. I can't believe they haven't. Yeah. This is like great. At the very least, there has to be a book on Soper. Like, this is the kind of thing that the public's eating up right now. Yeah. You know, thanks to this um, SARS, thanks to this economic collapse, you know? The SARS guard, SARS guard. Did you ever see that mm-hmm. Saturday Night Live skit? Uh-uh. It was during the SARS outbreak, and the uh, <laughs> SARS guard, the actor, what's right. his name? Peter, Peter SARS guard. He was on there pitching. It was like a little infomercial, and he's pitching the SARS guard, <laughs> SARS guard. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All righty. Uh, Josh, I'm going to call this... Uh, Moon Smackdown, the oh, nicest man. moon, the nicest Moon Smackdown we got. All right, because we got a lot of them, and this guy was actually really, Let's really get this over with. Kind about it, uh, guys. Love the podcast. I listen as I ride my bike to and from work past the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. On my way to the moon, learning interesting facts makes my day a little better. However, I had to send a note about a couple of mistakes in the Moon podcast. You got the current theories about the formation of the moon and how it affects Earth's precession, right? As far as I know. And those are really the hardest things to understand. So Thank well you. done. Yeah. But you did perpetuate a few myths. Number one, the moon doesn't rotate and is dragged along by the Earth. Well, sort of. The moon is held in place by the Earth's gravity, but it does rotate. The reason it doesn't appear to rotate, which is what we were trying to say, mm-hmm. uh, is because its period of rotation is exactly the same as its period of revolution around the Earth. About 29 days, it's tidally locked, which brings me to point number two. The moon has a, quote, dark side that is never illuminated. Not true. Uh, I don't remember saying that. Did we say that? We must have, because everyone said that we did. Maybe we didn't say this. Okay. Which led people to believe that we don't know it. All right. The moon has one face we never see from Earth, uh, but is not permanently in darkness. That's known as the far side of the moon. So it's Gary Larson, not Darth Vader. Huh. Nice. Wow. Wow. Uh, and number three, we have tides because the moon, quote, pulls up on the uh, water on the earth and pulls up on the earth underneath as well. Definitely not true. While the moon's gravity does pull up 
the Earth and its water, the effect is minuscule compared to the Earth's own gravity. It's the horizontal differential in the moon's gravity across the Earth that causes the water to slide towards and away the direction of the moon. So the water slides sideways, not up. Wow. That's pretty cool. And that is from Chris B., and he, he was very cool about it. Um, and he says, P.S., I'm a little worried about going back and listening to the Sun podcast because the Sun is way more complicated than the moon. Yeah. And Chris, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Just skip it, brother. Yeah. Go listen to Cannonball worth... Run. Yeah, that's a good one. No mistakes. That is a great, great one. Or Twinkies. That was pretty good, too. Yeah, Muppets. Yeah. Anything but the sun. Anything but that one. Um, I guess if you have a correction, we want to hear it. Um, we, we have, we've been reading them again now lately. I think that's good, Chuck. I forgot all about them. I forgot about being wrong. Well, we were right for a good stretch. Well, we weren't doing <laughs> ones like on the moon or whatever. Yeah. Well, these tough ones are hard. <laughs> yes, they are. Yes. Uh, if you have a correction, you can tweet it to us at SYSK Podcast. You can um, see us on Facebook at facebook.com slash stuff you should know. And you can send us a plain old fashioned email at stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 